authority doesn't specify the means of keeping the congregation all together in congregational singing. Some congregations use projectors and put the lyrics up on the screen. Some congregations use songbooks. Some congregations use a combination of both. Some congregations uh, uh, have the practice of, of uh, a midweek assembly or another assembly where they practice the songs and memorize the songs and sing them that way. Well, all of those are authorized expedients to facilitate the command to sing congregationally. So there, there is authority. Now, the pews. Are we authorized to assemble in one place on the first day of the week? Yes, we are. Acts chapter 20, verse 7. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Now, all of those passages, wherever we see the church addressed congregationally together is authority for the congregation to have a place to assemble together, meeting houses. So where does that specific authority specify where to meet? Or what to sit on? It doesn't. And so those are things that are authorized to facilitate the specific command of assembling, of uh, having a place to sit when we come together. Now we could assemble and we could all sit on pillows. <coughs> we sit in rocking chairs. We sit in bean bags. We sit in pews. You know, there's a, a trend now for these church chairs. I like them. They're nice. Is it authorized? Sure it is. It's a place to sit when we all come together. See, so that's generic authority. And so a lot of these objections that people raise to the principle of authority, they would not raise in any other realm. Now, you tell me who in their right mind would say that a general is not authorized to set up camp in whatever field when he's given the orders to go and wage a campaign in this particular field. Well, the orders don't specifically say to set the camp up right here and to put these tents over there and to put those tents over. The, the orders say, go wage a campaign over here. So does that authorize the general to do the things that are necessary to wage the campaign in that? Yes. See, nobody questions that. But you come to the things people do in worship and you say, well, those things aren't authorized. And they say, oh, well, we just need to throw all those principles of authority out. The principles of authority that people live by every day in every aspect of their life. And so, this morning we want to look at the biblical requirement to have authority for the things that we do. And one passage that tells us that we must, it, it's an imperative, it's not optional, it's not, you know, if, if we feel like it, it's an imperative. We must have authority for what we do. And the passage says in 1 Thessalonians 5.21, Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. And so what the Apostle Paul is, is uh, commanding there, or, or the Holy Spirit by the pen of, of Paul is commanding there, is that we examine all things, everything. And we determine whether or not those things are authorized by God. If they're authorized by God, then we're to hold on to them. We're to hold fast to them. If they're not authorized by God, then we're to reject it. See, that's prove all things, hold fast that which is good. So if we can't prove it, we're not supposed to hold to it. Now, when I discuss religious practice with people... I ask them a simple question. Can you show me a place in the Bible where that practice is authorized by God? Where the Bible says that you are allowed to do that? Because if you can't, if there's no passage by which you can prove that it's good, then you can't hold to it. It's got to be rejected. Over in 1 Peter 
It says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So this says to always be ready to give an answer. Now, what is the very clear implication of that giving an answer for the hope that is in you? That is, what you believe, what you hold to, what, what, what gives you that assurance and hope of heaven are things that can be answered, things that can be proved, things that can be demonstrated from Scripture. And, and you can say, well, the, the reason I don't get discouraged in the face of persecution, the reason I have this hope, the reason that no matter what you do to me, I'm going to continue to praise God and glorify God and strive for that heavenly home is because I can prove it. I can demonstrate that it's true beyond any shadow of a doubt. And so, see, we have the, we have the necessity uh, placed upon us to be able to prove what we do. And I've, I've made the uh, statement on live radio, live TV, internet, newspapers, tracks, wherever I can put it, <laughs> that I can put it and get it out. I'll make the statement that we only want to do those things that are authorized by Scripture. And I, I'll issue the challenge that if anybody can, can show, can demonstrate, where anything we do is not authorized by Scripture, then we will stop doing it. No questions asked. We'll stop it. Because if we are doing something, and I, I, I pray that that would be the mentality of all of the brethren, if we are doing something that's not authorized by Scripture, we're not supposed to be doing it. And on the flip side of that, if you can show me where we're not doing something, that the New Testament church of Christ is supposed to be doing today, then we'll start doing it. Because we have this obligation of Scripture placed upon us to prove all things. If we're supposed to be doing it, then we better be doing it. If we're not supposed to be doing it, then we better not be doing it. Otherwise, we don't have God's authority for what we do. And so... We have this mandate, this imperative statement made to demonstrate authority for whatever it is we do. And we can do that. Uh, when, when people ask us why we do the things that we do, we should be able to turn in Scripture and show them biblical authority for doing what we do. Now, of course, that, that places upon us the their requirement to study God's Word and to know what it says. We can't, we can't prove what we don't know. We can't answer from information that we don't have. So we're commanded to prove all things. We're, we're uh, commanded to be able to give an answer. That means we're commanded to know what this book says. And again, that's an imperative. Uh, a Christian doesn't have the option of being a, a student of the Bible or not. A Christian is commanded to be a student of the Bible and to know that book, to be able to give an answer for the hope that is in you. And so we have to prove all things. We have to demonstrate biblical authority for whatever we do. Now, what does that involve? Uh, as we talk about proving all things, we need to, to first demonstrate what is not proving all things. You know, because a lot of times when you ask somebody to show you why they do what they do, they appeal to all kinds of things. All, all manner of things other than the Word of God. And, and we need to understand that those are not authoritative uh, uh, sources to prove what we do. For example, uh, people will just make assumptions that what they're doing is okay. You know, I don't know how many times I've talked to people in the religious world and I've just simply asked them the question, why is it that this particular activity 